Good afternoon and welcome to the Print Think webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about data analytics. Um, so before we get started, um, let me just tell you a little bit about what we'll be doing today. Um, so um, we will be recording this session and you'll be able to share it with other people in your organization. Just access it from the TLMI website. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit them in the control panel that should be somewhere on your screen after you started the webinar. And then Steve and I will be more than happy to kind of answer your questions either throughout the webinar or towards the end, kind of depending on how they come in. So at this point, um, we want to talk a little bit about what our webinar is. Um, so as you all know, presses have changed a lot or equipment in the press shop has changed a lot over the, over the last 10 years. And you have sensors and you have all these things that are collecting data. And you start kind of wondering, what do I do with this now? You know, is there anything I can do to help me manage my business? And part of what Steve's going to talk about today is how to use those fancy gadgets that are on your presses as to how to help you analyze your business and to make more money. So at this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Steve Metcalf, our presenter today. So Steve, welcome. Hey, thanks, Keith, and, and uh, welcome, everybody. Hope everybody's having a nice balmy kickoff to their summer wherever you are. I know I know I am. Um, but uh, anyways, thanks for the opportunity and I guess we'll get right into it. Uh, should be advancing the screen here. So again, as Keith said, the title of the webinar is Data and Analytics. It's about the digital press room and this is really focusing more on, you know, we, we have machines that, that generate lots of data. A lot of times it's not accessible. So what can we do and what's sort of the, the process now to get it accessible and, and some of the things that are coming that we can all begin to utilize. Um, so briefly about me, uh, that's a pre-pandemic picture, obviously, um, but uh, I'm, I've been part of Baldwin Technology, which is a, uh, a large company that uh, has been in the graphics industry for, for years and years. Uh, and uh, we do everything, and I'll, I'll, I'll have a slide here in a second that'll go through what we do. Uh, but more importantly, the role that I play now is is the chief IoT officer for Baldwin and, and a platform that we've uh, basically created called AMP, uh, which I'll get into here in a second, which is an IoT Internet of Things uh, platform. So Baldwin, for those that don't know us, uh, kind of does everything. We're sort of everything but the press, but we do a lot of things on presses that make them run better and are fundamental to the process. So everything from surface treatment systems, uh, spray systems, Curing and drying, whether it's uh, UV or LED UV, uh, you know, hot air drying systems, uh, color control, color measurement, 100% uh, defect detection and inspection, and cleaning devices, automated cleaning. So we we play across the industry uh, from narrow web flexo to, to big CI flexo. Uh, we're in rotor gravure. We're in uh, offset the offset industry, both sheet bed and web offset, and that's sort of been the traditional realm of Baldwin. But one of the things, and this is sort of part of the, the story today, is, is as we developed and acquired companies that do all of these things at Baldwin, we needed a better way to connect the data from these systems. And it all started from a service and support point of view, you know, about five years ago. But as we got more into it, the depth of data, uh, the ability to use data as an advantage became apparent. And, and uh, today, uh, Baldwin has invented something or created a platform uh, called AMP, which is essentially, you can think of it as all of your machine data sort of into one platform. And it's, uh, I'll, I'll get in, into a description of what that is here in a second. Uh, but so a little more backdrop, we hear this term industry 4.0 or 4.0 uh, that was coined and, and really the fourth, you know, generation or revolution of the industrial or fourth stage of the industrial revolution. And it's a little bit useful to kind of go through sort of where do we, how do we get here? So the first industry, or industry 1.0, can really be more about mechanization, as power uh, was available to, to harness. Uh, the second stage was really the introduction of electricity and sort of the uh, introduction of assembly lines using electric power as a, as a, as a, as a resource. Uh, the third stage of industry uh, is really about the computerization. So that really came around in the 80s and 90s and continues today with sort of automated production computers, IT, robots, et cetera. And really the fourth stage is, is a lot of people th think of it as smart factory, factory of the future, autonomous systems, uh, but it has a lot to do with IoT, Internet of Things, and machine learning, but it's really based on data or data, depending on where you are in the world. 
And uh, so that's really the key, I think, going forward is to just sort of remember that concept. Industry 4.0 is really about data acquiring it and what we can do with data once we've got it. And we have sort of a premise that we throw out, and I, I really haven't met anybody yet that would disagree with the statement, is that data will drive the next great advantage in the labels and packaging industry, as it will in essentially every industry, from every type of manufacturing to consumer products to even our own health. A lot of people are wearing wearables now that measure data, uh, report data. So it's, it's a big thing that's happening everywhere. And, and what's driving this, and I, I like to share this a little bit just to give people some context that, you know, as most people know, there's an exponential growth rate of technology happening behind the scenes. And uh, this particular chart comes from uh, my favorite futurist, a guy named Peter Diamandis, uh, who's famous for founding the XPRIZE uh, uh, Foundation for Space Exploration. Um, but what he talks about a lot is exponential growth of technology. And this is a, just one way to look about it on the vertical axis. It's basically the calculations per second of a, of a microprocessor uh, for about $1,000. So you can think of $1,000 if you bought a iPhone or a Galaxy phone off of contract. That's about what you, what you spend on processing power today. And if you look at around 2022, uh, where we are, you know, that processing power is approaching the power of, of the equivalent power of calculations of the entire human brain. So, so we're getting close to that. And you know, about 2023, so next year, that thousand dollars will have as much compute computational power as the human mind. Uh, and if you fast forward that through exponential growth, uh, by you know, hopefully within most of our lifetimes here in 2050 that same thousand dollars will buy enough processing power as the entire human race, which is an astounding thing just to think about and hard to wrap your head around. But it's because of this uh, change, this sort of driving force in tech that's happening behind the scenes, whether it's just the, the computational processing power uh, getting cheaper and cheaper more and greater and greater all the time, as well as data storage and the hyper cloud and some of the things we can do today with the biggest cloud data providers that is making some of these things possible that we can do with that analytics and uh, is making this industrial uh, industry 4.0 real. So just to kind of keep that in mind. And we see that reflected. This is a company called IoT Analytics uh, that monitors the global Internet of Things market forecast. And this is just a, an example of a chart sort of tracking connected machines, sort of globally uh, machines that are connected through an IoT sort of platform technology around the world. And uh, it stalled out a little bit during the pandemic, but it's back to the growth, the projected growth rate of about 22% a year, which is really amazing when you think of all the different things we can connect from an industrial point of view. I'm just seeing that sort of reflected a little bit in, in this. And one of the things I've done is sort of the best way maybe to describe what we can do with data is to almost take an approach of uh, a case study from the future. So maybe in a few years from now, uh, one of us or many of us could be on panels, uh, webinars, talking about what we're doing with data and how we're solving problems. And so this is a little bit of a maybe a teaser on sort of what that might sound like if we if we fast forwarded to a few years from now. Uh, so the first thing we might say are things like we're now able to capture all the data generated by really all of our machines in real time, and we can do it automatically without human intervention. So it's a, it's a, it's a live data hookup to our production assets and machines. And the second thing, once we've got that, is we can compare our live and our historical data. We can visualize our productivity, or OEE, the overall equipment effectiveness, uh, across our machines and sites in real time. And we may say things like, we can then easily see the root cause of problems that we long suspected were there. Because uh, a lot of us, I think, have a hunch as to what's the, what's the cause of waste or machine stoppage and things like that. But uh, really, today's fault logs don't give us enough information. So but, uh, through data, we can begin to see what was the underlying root cause. You know, was it something related to the machine speed or power or other variables that happened in the process? And, and we can start measuring them and putting safeguards in. So we can now measure and compare and contrast our production quality across our machines, across operators, plants, uh, things like inks, coatings, chem uh, materials, or analogs, or chemistry in the process, and the ability to do this and, and really use that information to uh, set better targets, become better at running machines, uh, stabilize quality, uh, really becomes the next next thing we can, we can do with that. Uh, we can also identify very tiny trends that maybe only a machine can detect uh, that could have an outsized impact on our quality. 
And you know, through that, we can eliminate a majority of unplanned downtime altogether. So machine stoppages related to quality issues, uh, et cetera, or even the machine itself, the function of the machine itself can really be tracked and sort of alerted well ahead of a, you know, a, an event that could bring capacity to a, to a stop. Uh, we can identify our root causes of waste and rejected product before it happens and, and essentially put measures in to prevent it. And we can understand the relationship between things, uh, and really the relationship between the data uh, of things like our chemistry, our color, pressure, temperature, speed, surface treatment, curing, uh, really anything that, that, that the press does uh, or any machine does. Uh, you know, we talk about the press primarily because there's a lot of variables going on there. But it could be in, you know, in, in slitting and rewinding and other things, other aspects of production, and really ability to control for these, to get ahead of them, uh, to understand how they relate, and uh, to use the data to drive uh, improvement. And we can connect in, our, we can merge live data from our machines with uh, other data. So the machines are coming with with hundreds of sensors now, which is which is really interesting. We still have older assets that maybe don't have these. But the ability to really add sensor data to not only just environmental data from our factory, but auxiliary information from the machines, and I've got an example of this a little bit later in the, in the presentation, uh, can be really powerful and can create new advantages. So understanding things like temperatures and humidities and vibration and air quality could play into uh, things that we're doing every day and could account for some differences between when we run something you know, in the summer versus a, a different season. Etc. So that's that's a very powerful ability that is going to be coming to us pretty quickly, and we can connect and merge live data not only from our machines, but we can we can merge it with data from our ERP, our MIS systems, our workflows, so job data, anything that can essentially emit an electronic uh, record that can give us data context. Uh, so the example that if you're tracking all the live data from your machine, the ability to put it into the context of your jobs your customers, uh, your operators, your materials, et cetera. That's going to be through these APIs, these application programming interfaces that uh, will exist between these systems you already have, as well as this, this, these new data capabilities. And then uh, another thing we can do is we can begin to augment the intelligence or the performance of operators and really give them tools that can put our process on an autopilot. You know, anyone who's buying a new vehicle these days you know, it, it went from, you know, essentially the, the crew, you know, basic cruise control on a vehicle to, uh, you know, essentially an auto cruise control. And now you can stay within lanes. And if you go out and buy a Tesla, you can actually have the car drive itself if you want to spend the money to do it. So this ability to sort of put the process on autopilot through some tools and through essentially making the operators better, giving them additional data about what they're doing on press and also making it similar, you know, between presses. So if you have different vintages of machines there you have different brands of machines they often are dashboarded uh, uh, nicely but if there's a learning curve as you go machine to machine control to control they'll be able to sort of overlay that and, and pull data into a common view is going to be an important thing that can take that first step to putting things on autopilot and this is another idea uh, that we may be able to talk about in the features we can now give our customers and our brand owners not just the conformity reports that a lot of them are asking more and more for but we give them live access to our job, to their job status if necessary. So we can use access to information of what's on a machine, how it's tracking, essentially as a as your job is here, essentially, and can, and can create some new advantages for customers that uh, through the data that we can record and collect on a job. And ultimately, I think we'll say things like this: we did it with an advanced machine monitoring platform. Or fundamentally, we did it with an, an IoT or Internet of Things platform and, uh, through live data acquisition. And so what does that really look like? And so for every production asset that you've got from the press itself to the connected peripherals, it's really a starting with the idea of data points gathering uh, data. We'll, there's a new vocabulary word that we'll throw out today called telemetry. Uh, the, the data telemetry that can be gathered from a machine. And it starts with really basic KPI stuff, you know, the machine speed, its status, is it running, how fast it's running, is it making sellable product or is it not? Is it stopped or is it in make ready stage, et cetera. And then begin and putting that data into context of customers and jobs and where you're spending the time if it's not running, uh, faults, we, you know, things like that that you can capture as well as any other data that the press itself is, has privy to uh, pressures, tensions, et cetera, other settings, uh, we can begin to pull that in and, and aggregate it together. 
for every connected peripheral you have on machines. And oftentimes these these um, subsystems have as much to do with quality or maybe even more to do with the quality of what's coming out uh, than the machine itself. You know, the, the UV curing systems, the corona treatment systems, uh, et cetera, they all have data. They have lamp power status. They have other things uh, that they're doing uh, that could lead this, you know, to maybe a quality or defect rate climbing, et cetera. So just understanding what's going on with these connected peripherals is also going to be of interest. Uh, inspection systems, color systems. So we can we can essentially merge in information from image inspection, the defect rates, uh, be able to monitor that, uh, put that data together with other data happening on press. You know, so it's speed, it's uh, it's you know the other uh, example of your EV power that's being you know applied to the process. Uh, we can look at waste. We can look at both and again both live and historical. Uh, auxiliary sensors are things that I think we're going to see more and more of. So this is an example from one of our sister companies, AMS Spectral UV, that's a, essentially a live cure sensor device. So it's a device that's essentially measuring, it's, it's made up of a number of sensors that's looking not at the output power of a curing lamp, but uh, the actual um, the output of the curing process. So the, 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 the electrochemical signature of a curing reaction unit to unit. And with that, you can begin to detect things in line such as over cure or under cure. So a lot of things um, related to the process as it's flying through the machine. And, you know, sometimes we wonder, you know, is, is what's in that role going to be the same as we, we saw during make ready? We can now sort of lock in a make ready, uh, you know, golden uh, image or golden step and say, OK, let's let's reproduce that. And let's alert our quality people to know that if we're running out of tolerance on UV or lamps are degrading or we uh, the operator forgot to set something, you know, we can really start to understand that data. And as customers are beginning to ask more and more for this type of information in conformity reports to uh, to support whether it's a low migration in process, uh, this is going to become the kind of data that creates a new advantage. So these these types of things that are happening now can integrate in with that stack of data that's being extracted from the machine in real time. And of course, uh, uh, store it for the life of the process of the machine. Uh, another thing we can do is live data streams in, and most of the data streaming into these plat platforms come in at, comes in at about once every second or even in the, in the millisecond range. Uh, but for every piece of data or telemetry, uh, we can we can start to measure it and we can create actions. And this is an example of you don't need to know com computer programming uh, to do this, but setting a threshold of something that we want to be notified about. And we can send an email or a text message to uh, really one or more individuals uh, immediately if the press stops for example let's go if the press stops before we hit a target quantity or count uh, you know let's go out on the floor to understand why it stopped maybe help the operator a little bit so those are examples of live action in your data uh, also creating uniform uniform live custom dashboards where essentially put your process on sort of the visual mode where uh, not only quality people can watch what's going on uh, managers but also you can put these tools right by the press and, and uh, uh, the example of a radar chart there, which is showing uh, really sort of values as they relate. Uh, so anything uh, that might be of interest, uh, we call that process radar. So uh, you instruct the operator, hey, for our process, keep that blob in the green. And if it starts turning yellow, that means that something's out of tolerance. So the tolerances that we've set up for the process, or if it turns red, you basically want to stop the press and, and investigate something. So this ability to kind of create live information and visual information uh, from the live streaming data and historical data is going to be one of the other key advantages we'll have. And then also the ability to deeply interact with data. So in this, this is an example of something we call the deep chart, where you can essentially, it's a UR here in your data. You can navigate it as it unfolds. You can go back in time. You can uh, look at, in this case, you can see data that's tagged a job. So you can see, okay, how did that job run versus the next job? Uh, be, really go back into the into the history of information. Uh, so if a job comes up that's run before, uh, we'll have an ability to look that up and then you know very quickly uh, apply kind of the similar runtime parameters or understand how that how that ran. Uh, so think of it as sort of a job data recorder. And, and of course, this data can also be fed into customers for conformity reports, etc. So one of the other capabilities that we'll see. And so in getting there. Uh, you know, we think of it as sort of three steps. 
So the first step or stage is just getting to unlock your information, unlock your data, get to, we call it get to know your data. Uh, so everybody's got data. Uh, it's on the floor. It's oftentimes in machines uh, that's trapped. It's not really doing anybody good other than it's you can visualize it maybe at the local machine HMI um, uh, control window. Uh, but really starting to do things such as uh, putting in what we call edge device connectors to the machines that begin to uh, unlock that information and stream it into a platform uh, where we can begin to do these things. So begin to capture live data telemetry. Uh, this is going to require uh, the Internet of Things sort of architectural components, and it'll require a big data platform that can ingest all the information and store it at a very low cost. Uh, and then the, uh, with that, we can begin to produce some useful analytics uh, to be able to look at both live information as it's unfolding, as well as historical data, monitor that, and then start to visualize it. So that's really step one. And then step two is once we get comfortable with our information, start putting that data to work, uh, establishing the relationships between the data. Uh, so things, you know, we could begin to observe this, as I said earlier, kind of things that we long suspected were related. Now we should be able to start seeing them with data that's being aggregated. And uh, one of the things these platforms uh, can start to allow us to do is create our own data streams from data. So we may be able to take two or three things that are happening and aggregate kind of create our own data stream or data telemetry based on some raw data telemetry. So things that interest us that we want to know about when this and this happen at the same time, uh, then I want to get an alert. Uh, those abilities will be there as well. And then, and then now that you've got your own data, uh, putting rules and alerts so that you can begin to act on it, get notified, take an action, uh, drive productivity, productivity improvement or an operator, a software, an operator learning gap, et cetera. And then uh, begin to connect the machine data with your MIS systems, your ERP, your workflow to improve the context of what you're looking at and really give that, that next step a competitive advantage. And the third step is really, once you've got that going, is implementing data-driven autonomous action. So starting to get to sort of more of that autopilot mode of the process where you're really unlocking greater productivity or overall equipment effectiveness, you're reducing the defects and rates, uh, and waste, uh, you're increasing quality stability, uh, you know, just the stability of quality because we can now control for things and conformity. Uh, there are customers you're looking for, operator ability and performance. Uh, we can augment and enhance scheduling, the scheduling process through data. We can begin to measure things like sustainability. A lot of, a lot of brand owners are wanting not just to know that we're green, but that we're actually measuring it and we can, we can give them a, an energy utilization or a a carbon footprint report on every job that they run so to feed their sustainability initiatives and provide customers with data for an advantage. So really this is about creating advantages with data at that point. And just a little sort of dropping to a level, sort of how does this happen on a machine? If you sort of think of all the different types of assets, and these are just some of the printing assets that we think of every day, uh, is that in the middle of this sort of idea of an MQTT connector, and I'll get to that in a second, which is going to consist of a gateway. Uh, this is kind of a uh, thing shown here is called an E1, which is a very common uh, gateway that's been put into modern machines. A lot of these run on 5G, so they run wirelessly now. In addition to, they can you can wire them, you can connect them via Ethernet to your network. We can connect to presses uh, through PLC connectors, and then just this sort of data mapping exercise. And then ultimately, that flows over to the right, which is is bringing that data into a platform. Uh, where we can uh, we can monitor it and we can begin to do the things that, that I just uh, described. An example on on the platform we call AMP uh, would be sort of you you get an account on AMP, you set it up. Uh, AMP runs in the cloud. It's a it's a, what we sort of refer to now as the hyper cloud. So it's it's uh, running on some incredibly powerful secure servers in the background. Uh, but essentially, what you do is you you, you come up with a with a group uh, for your 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 entity your um, your sites, uh, your users, so locations, and then you start adding your machines. And uh, and then with the machines, you may have connected devices, sensors to those, or subsystems, and then you begin to build out what your your data structure would look like. And now we get into this uh, this thing called MQTT, which is actually a it's a really cool acronym. But what is it in general? So MQTT is a is a protocol. It's an industry standard for Internet of Things systems. This stands for message queuing and telemetry transport. It was developed in about 1999. 
And it's basically what HTML is to a website, MQTT is to data gathering into a data system that's powered by IoT. And uh, it's a standard, and you can think of it as a publish subscribe standard. So it's uh, uh, not to get too technical here, but essentially uh, the payload of every message, every MQTT message that would be flying over, you know, off of your equipment into a into a big data platform uh, would come as an MQTT message form, and it includes a telemetry section. Again, the telemetry being the data values that you're tracking, the key data values, and the actual values per variable. Uh, the context of it, that could be your jobs, your customer, your operator, other sort of static things that happen, role IDs. Uh, and then that, and metadata, which is just says, okay, here's what device it came from. This is the connected, this is the exact machine that it came from. And uh, I'm not gonna get any more technical than the next slide here, but this is just an example for anybody who's looked at, you know, what a HTML page looks like. It's essentially very similar, an MQTT message as you unpack it. Uh, this is an example of the telemetry section, you know, being some voltages, uh, some currents and temperatures, and the actual values. And the values would be stamped every second by the the controller that's uh, that's that's basically publishing these to the IoT device. The context that comes with it could be the job name and the job ID or an operator name, for example. And then the metadata is where it came from. So this is essentially all it is to do this. And one of the cool things about this platform is that as you evolve your data, you, maybe we just start on a machine by connecting its speed, its, uh, its some temperature, some status uh, information, et cetera, and we start transmitting that. But as we add more information, maybe we add sensors or more data becomes available from some of the connected accessories, uh, essentially this, this MQTT uh, template just keeps growing and the schema, which is a database term, just the, you know, the, the rows uh, essentially in columns on, on in the back, in the background, keep evolving automatically. So you can continue to just add more data to your stack all the time. And that's kind of some of the, the ways this thing are, you know, the, the flexibility uh, of data gathering today, uh, it is, it is, is truly amazing and easy to do a very lightweight as well. And so this is sort of behind the scenes what all this would take to to make happen. Uh, I'm going to stop there uh, and uh, really open it up uh, to anybody who's got a question. Uh, Keith, if you've got things that I've skipped over, you want to ask me those, uh, I'd be happy to address anything. No, uh, we, we we had one comment we, that uh, they enjoyed the or they commented on the bird chirping in the background. That, oh. that was a really <laughs> They made a joke, which I appreciated, that uh, canaries and coal mines were the best early sensors um, back in the day. Um, so how difficult is it to transition over from, you know, this, the area where you're not collecting data and then actually finding meaningful data to um, use in your system or to manage with? Yeah, so I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the companies we talked to today, it's sort of approaching it as, you know, what if you could just start with some basic productivity information on every machine you have? You know, just, you know, what is it running? You know, what speed is it running at? Um, is it is it making you money or not? So a lot of, I, I, we were just recently at a, at a trade event where people, I, I had a few people literally say, I just want to know if the machine's running or not. You know, and, and that is, you could think of that's your sort of core value driver. That's your, you know, the, the, like a stock ticker for your business, you know, are they working? And, and more importantly, when they're not working, where are you spending the time? What are your, why did they go down? Why did your operators, what are your operators doing? So some of those reason codes that come out of that. So a lot of people can think of it starting there. Uh, the other, you know, a lot of the newer machines and newer connected devices, certainly the devices that, uh, that Baldwin has for the machines come already ready for this. So if you spec these on a press or if you, you spec a press that has these sensors, uh, you can literally load up as much data as possible from the machine control itself or from the from the controllers of these devices. And they're essentially ready to go to feed you information into this into this stack. So it's really could be as simple as one to two to three data points, or it could be hundreds of data points if it's maybe a production or workhorse machine that you really want to understand more about what's going on. And the same goes for software, you know, integrating the data points from uh, electronic job ticketing system, systems, such as the label tracks. Uh, is something we're working on right now so that that context can overlay into the data. Okay, um, so we, we have a question from uh, someone in the audience asking about essentially pricing, which you know mm -hmm. generally for any webinar that we do, you know, it, generally, someone always will go to that. 
So pricing for systems like this, you know, you're going to be looking at per machine, you know, as a per user. How how are the different pricing models for different companies, and how do they come about that? Yeah, we we believe, and actually, this is this is sort of the pricing model that we're we're coming into the market with, is essentially uh, per connected machine. So it's and it, and it 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 scales from you know the level of data and the value of that machine to you in, in the organization. So a good example, our our pricing actually starts at forty nine dollars a month per connected machine for up to about ten data points, so basic productivity information, and you know that could be, think of it a little bit more as a proxy for the machine value. That might be useful for a slitter rewinder or something that's, uh, that, that you can think of it like your billing rate. If you go up to say a production, uh, like a narrow web press, it maybe, you know, starts to get into a realm of, you know, several hundred data points. Uh, it, it, the scale, the pricing kind of starts scaling up to maybe 200 uh, an hour or 200, uh, $200 a machine per month, which is sort of, again, a proxy on, one hour billable time of that press, maybe on average, is about 200-ish, you know. And if you can gain one hour productivity a month through using data, uh, you've hit an ROI point on that. And then as machines scale up and get more and more data, you know, the pricing can scale up from there. So, you know, we've got customers that, that are looking at sort of an enterprise-wide contract, uh, but it doesn't, you don't need to that. So this is a, this is sort of, I call it, this is a, this is sort of, this new wave of this is not your father's software model, software acquisition model. This is basically, uh, you know, kind of a no commitment. It's a, it's a, it's a software as a service utility. Uh, so you essentially just sign up for what you need. And with signing up uh, comes support and things like that, onboarding support. And how do you get, how do you start getting things connected? Okay. Um, another question from the audience. Um, so the context data, data for specific jobs, the, that type of information. So job ticket IDs, employee information, you know, is that manually inputted, scanned in from barcodes? Describe some of the things that you have or you've seen well, in the uh, industry. So, so most people you know, are familiar with a job package or job, you know, job ticket that comes out of their MIS or their ERP system. And you know, today, if if you're doing that you're sort of a, a paper-based system in your ERP and MIS, is electronic record of that. So, what AMP has is a is an API, an application programming interface that can receive data from a typical uh, job system. Uh, you know, you can think of it sort of the standard job data would be sort of a JDF, JML type format. Uh, but basically there would be a publish subscribe from that. And so as, as jobs get queued up on machines, uh, that can automatically flow, excuse me, flow into a platform like this, but it can also be augmented right at press. So, you know, that sort of the matching or the marrying of the job data or the, or the job that's being queued up on the schedule to what's actually running on the machine. There's a, a you know bit of an operator intervention saying, okay, this job is starting to run, or the machine has the, the, the job code, so we can, we can automatically tag that. Another ability that will be in these systems is, is to start recording not just the data, but the notes as the job ran. So as operators are making notes, if a machine stopped, why did it stop? Uh, tracking some of that history sort of, you know, for the next time we run a job will be very easy to do. Um, so essentially, it's it's there's it's kind of think of it as an augmented process to move data electronically to to the press side, so we can then tag the data that's running on the machine, record it, and then do something useful with it. Send it back to uh, estimating, uh, so you'll have actuals tracked very quickly, uh, or, and or expose data to the customers if they're interested in looking at job status. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, we have another question here. Um, which ERPs do you work with for data integration? So, good question. So we're taking, uh, I guess I, one way to say it is all of them, uh, but we're taking an approach of, of developing an API, which, which uh, so AMP is, is sort of surrounded by APIs, which uh, can can e assist the, the import of data or the, the subscription of data into the platform. Uh, one of the companies we are working with, so we're starting with market leaders, so label tracks is, uh, uh, if anybody's uh, running an web process in the U.S., they're probably at least familiar with label tracks, if not running the software. Uh, so that's an example. But, you know, as you look across the industry, you know, AMP is sort of an open platform. And the idea is to work with really all the all the big names of the tech providers that we use every day to keep our machines running and keep our business running. Okay. Um, if there are any other questions, please go ahead and submit them. But in the meantime, um, I'll go ahead and start our wrap up. Uh, like I said, I will check to see if there are any other last minute questions, but 
I'd like to stay, or thank Steve for a great presentation, um, very informative. Uh, you didn't go too nerdy on any of us, so we were able to kind of keep up with you. So we do all appreciate that. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the TLMI website. So you'll be able to see it at a later date, watch it with other team members or share it with other members of your organization to where you feel it might be appropriate for your company. So um, let's double check, no last minute questions. Steve, I would like to thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the TLMI team for helping put all of this together, um, the work that they do, and most importantly, everybody who is in the audience. I'd like to thank you for being here as well, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.